Hello, hi. I want to talk in this video very briefly about the mens rea of murder. So murder, of course, we discuss in detail in chapter five of the book. Um, the reason I want to discuss uh, the mens rea of murder is just to illustrate a point that's useful for this offence, but equally applicable across the mens rea of multiple other offences as well. So just as uh, I'm sure you're aware, the mens rea of murder is defined in the case law as malice aforethought, but that's been interpreted in modern parlance to mean that the, the uh, defendant must have acted with the intention, with an intention either to kill or to at least to cause serious bodily harm or grievous bodily harm. And that was interpreted in cases like Vickers and Cunningham, etc. Now, the point that I'm trying to make here is that when you think about the mens rea of, of a particular offence, try and recognise the various ways in which that mens rea can be alternatively satisfied. So, for example here, if we think about intention, there are two broad ways in which we can find an intention. The most obvious one is a direct intention. Now a direct intention is where the defendant acts with the aim or purpose or desire to bring about a certain result or a certain uh, circumstance. The other is oblique. So oblique intention is where the defendant foresees as a virtual certainty a particular result, for example, will come about. It is a virtual certainty that that result will come about and the jury choose to find an intention. So in that way, we have two options. We also, with, of course, within the mens rea of murder, have these two, vari uh, these two varied results that the defendant can intend in order to be liable for the offence or at least in order to satisfy the mens rea. So essentially what we have are four ways in which the defendant can satisfy the mens rea of murder, either by a direct intention to kill, a direct intention to cause grievous bodily harm, an oblique intention to kill, or an oblique intention to cause grievous bodily harm. Now, when, when applying the law to problem facts, it's useful to think in these terms and basically to lead your reader through the various options. Sometimes it's quite tempting when you're answering a problem question to think mens rea of murder, intention to kill or cause GB GBH, and maybe just apply one of these and miss out the others and not think f fully about the others. But sometimes it will be necessary to lead your reader through all of the options. Uh, an example which is quite useful is actually from a problem question we set in a, uh, an exam a couple of years ago. In this scenario we had a defendant who um, was out to, aiming to go and kill a rival from another gang, but on confrontation with this rival from another gang, that rival grabbed one of the defendant's friends and held him in front of him as a human shield. Now the defendant chose in that scenario that he still wanted to kill the rival, so he shot through his friend in order to hit the rival and ideally kill him. And what happened is both of the uh, victims in that scenario died, both of the individuals who were shot. Now when it comes to the person, the rival in the background, we can say, was there an intention to kill? The actus reus of murder is clearly satisfied. Was there an intention to kill? And we can start here in the first option. Was there a direct intention to kill? Yes, of course there was. When the defendant shot, he intentionally shot through his friend in order to, with the aim, the desire, the purpose of killing the victim. But then we have to think about the second victim, the friend of the defendant. Again, the actus reus of murder is satisfied. He's done an action which has caused death. This time we can say, is there a direct aim, intention to kill that person? This time, no, there isn't. He hoped that his friend would survive. He intentionally tried to shoot him in such a way that it would harm him, but hopefully he would survive. Is there a direct intention to cause grievous bodily harm? Now this is perhaps more debatable, but we could ask ourselves, what happens if the victim jogged out of the way at the last moment or was dropped or managed to um, avoid the bullet? Would our defendant be unhappy? No, of course he wouldn't. It's his friend. He would be very happy. So therefore, it's at least debatable that perhaps there isn't a direct intention to cause grievous bodily harm. Then we have to look, is there an oblique intention maybe to kill? Does he foresee death as a virtual certainty? And again, the answer on the facts was no, he didn't. He foresaw a chance of the death happening, but he absolutely hoped that it wouldn't. And so therefore, there doesn't look like there's an oblique intention. He not only hoped that it wouldn't, but he foresaw a chance that it might not result in death. Therefore, no foresight of a virtual certainty. And it's then the last option where you think, well, did he at least foresee as a virtual certainty that grievous bodily harm would be caused? And the answer here was yes. 
Although he didn't want grievous bodily harm to be caused, he did foresee it as necessary. Um, he did foresee it as inevitable, essentially, in order to kill the victim who he tried to kill. He saw it as basically inevitable that his friend would at least suffer serious bodily harm. So the point here is that when you're writing um, an answer to a question of this kind, it makes more sense to lead your reader through and to think about the various options within the mens rea almost as a tick box inside your own head, where you can say, in relation, for example, that second victim, there's no direct intention in either regard because it's not the aim or purpose, therefore we need to engage with the idea of oblique intention. Again, this is lacking in relation to causing death, but it is present in relation to causing grievous bodily harm. Now, exactly as this works in relation to murder, it works for, across all offences. A lot of offences require a mens rea, for example, of intention or recklessness as to a particular result or a particular circumstance. So in that way, again, you can think in your mind, what is the result? And first of all, does our defendant act with the intention to cause it? If not, do they act w uh, with at least foresight of a risk that they're going to cause it in terms of recklessness? But again, Try and create that tick box within your mind of the various mental states that will be enough to satisfy the mens rea. If any one of those are satisfied, as it was here, then the mens rea for the offence will be found. Thanks.